Around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. I would like to take the opportunity today to welcome you to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Tuesday. Today's Tuesday, February the 5th. 2019. I do want to say thank you for the many of you who took the time to fast with us and to pray with us. I am certitude. I am confident that God will bless every effort that we put forth concerning the kingdom of God. God is not unrighteous. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter six, verse 10, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered unto the saints of God. We minister in different capacities. We minister through prayer. We minister through fasting. We minister through giving. We minister through preaching uncompromisingly the word of God. So God says to us here in Hebrews 6.10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. God is faithful. And I want to say thank you for those of you, whether it was one day or the entire 21 days, that's, that's irrelevant. What counts is that we did something to affect the world through and by the kingdom of God. I do want to take a moment today to remind you of our conference, Age of Deception, Age of Deception, this April the 5th through the 7th at the Hickory Metro Convention Center, 1960 13th Avenue Drive, Southeast Hickory, North Carolina, 28602. I pray that you will put forth your best effort and come be a part of this great conference. I'm anticipating a tremendous move of God. I'm anticipating God to speak to our hearts and to bring us to a place of a spiritual renewal, spiritual revival, This nation will never see revival until preachers begin to preach against sin. It is impossible. It is impossible to have a Holy Ghost heaven sent revival without preaching against sin and preaching repentance. Yet, somehow those that are deceived believe somehow, some way, that we're going to have a revival without preaching repentance. It will not happen. It will not happen. Steve Quayle, Hugo DeGarris, Russ Dizdar, Irvin Baxter, Jimmy D. Smith, Doug, Joe Hagman, and myself will be there ministering. We're going to have a discussion panel, a time for questions and answers. My family and I will be taking care of the music come Sunday morning. We'll be serving communion after the service And then we'll be having a baptismal service following the closing of the meeting. Please register as soon as you can. It helps us to know how to prepare and to get ready for the size of the crowd that we need to uh, take care of. And there are many, many motels with just in walking distance, within two-tenths of a mile, uh, right there at the convention center, the Hampton Inn Courtyard Fairfield in Best Western Crown Plaza Minimum. If you go to our website, all of that is posted there, and uh, you'll see that everything is there that you will possibly need. So please, please be a part of this conference. I don't know how many more times we'll be able to do this. We've often had many people say, why don't you guys ever come over to the East Coast? Well, we're doing that. We're doing that for you. 
Going all the way out to Branson is a flyover state. It's a long travel, even for me, 850 miles. But we did this because of the accessibility with interstates I-26, I-40, I-77, and I-85. People can come from North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. All of these states, we, we should have, the place should be packed out in all reality. Uh, and I'm, I'm asking God to bless us, that we can bless you in return. So please, April the 5th through the 7th, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday will be the conference. We'll be serving communion Sunday and then having baptismal service following that Sunday afternoon. We began teaching on this new subject, the time of the end, in Matthew chapter 24 some weeks ago. I said in the beginning when we got to verse 15, we would elaborate, but not to the degree we did on our other teaching series. If you haven't ever gotten the series on DVD or CD, and, and it's called on our website, Revelation Study Notes. It's not about the book of Revelation. It is revelation concerning the things that God has shown me about the time of the end. We have three DVDs or CDs entitled The Abomination of Desolation, The Seven Kings of Revelation, and then, of course, The Fall Events. Fall Events, we show clearly, distinctly, how Christ will return in the fall of the year. It was October the 12th, 539 B.C., when Darius came in and brought down the Babylonian Empire that was being reigned and ruled under Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. That fulfilled the 70 years of captivity. So if, if October the 12th, 539 B.C. fulfilled the 70-year cycle of captivity, then it had to begin in the fall of the year. Jeremiah eight twenty says the harvest is past. The summer is ended, and we are not saved. I, I show clearly in the Word of God, the Scriptures, how Christ will return in the fall of the year, fulfilling the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles. Secondly, we discuss in detail out of Revelation chapter 17, the seven kings of Revelation, how that five are fallen, one is and one is yet to come. And when he comes, the Bible said he must continue for just a short space. Just a short space. How long is it? 42 months, 1260 days, time, times, and half a time. One is Five are fallen. Five kingdoms had fallen. One is. That would be the Roman Empire when John was writing this. The other is not yet come, and when he cometh... He must continue a short space, and the beast that was and is not even, he is the eighth, and he is of the seven that goeth into perdition. When the Antichrist comes, the seventh kingdom, the seventh head, will be established. Once that kingdom is established, the little horn, the eighth, he arises up. That's because he's a, he has a genetically DNA attachment to all past previous kingdoms. Why? Because he's of his father, the devil. See, there was the Egyptian, the Syrian, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian. Those were the five fallen kingdoms. Five are fallen. One is Rome is six. This Antichrist kingdom that will come will be the seventh. And out of that ten horns will arise this little horn, and that will be the Antichrist. And then, of course, the abomination of desolation here. And Matthew 24, verse 15, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. I will exegete this briefly because it would take me a good hour, hour and a half to go through the details, but that all those details are in the teaching of the abomination of desolation along with the seven kings of Revelation uh, and then, of course, fall events showing, describing clearly how Christ will return in the fall of the year. 
There's been a lot of dispute, a lot of questions about what is the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is simple. It is Revelation 13 when the false prophet decrees that the people are to make an image like unto the beast. This image is then set in the temple of God. That's an idol. That is a statue. It is an abomination because it will be put in the holy of holies. It will be put there. And this man, the Antichrist, will declare himself to be God. Now, let me say, first of all today, the church, the church of Jesus Christ will be here on the earth to witness this abomination of desolation. Now, I know most of you have been taught emphatically, relentlessly, you're not going to be here. And I know all the chicanery. I know all of the trickery because I've had to work through this for the last 25 years. 25 years ago, this coming May, was when God gave me the revelation after a 40-day fast that the rapture, pre-tribulation rapture, was erroneous. It was a fallacy. It still is a fallacy. It's not true. But Jesus says here to his disciples, were these not Christian disciples? Yes. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Now in your Bible, most of your Bibles, you'll see the phrase, whoso readeth, let him understand, is in parentheses. Because this is going to be revelation, understanding, and knowledge that for the most part the world, and sad to say the church, is simply not going to believe or embrace. But I challenge you to go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day shall not come? Go back to verse 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Verse 3, that day shall not come. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our gathering together unto him. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. I challenge you to read that passage of Scripture, read it honestly, read it with spiritual integrity, and you will see clearly the church is going to be here when this revelation is manifested. If I recall, the, the, the letter begins to the church at Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy under the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This epistle is written to the church. Are you a part of the church? Are you attached to, to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you? Paul is telling the church what to expect. This is why in verse 5 he says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Paul is telling the church, I'm going to be gone. I'm not going to be here. But you need to remember how this is going to unfold. You need to realize clearly, unmistakably, you need to understand how this abomination of desolation is going to take place. You're going to be here. You're going to see it. How can we be so adamant? 
because he says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except. What day is he talking about? Verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That is exactly synonymous with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall be raised first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. Paul says, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Again, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. There's the word again, gather, gathering together unto him. Same phrase here in 2 Thessalonians 2. 2. The rapture, the second advent, is the one, same in one. There's not a pre-tribulation rapture and then a second advent. There's only one second coming of Christ. Paul says, let no man deceive you by any means. This is the problem. Paul knew you would be deceived. Paul knew there would be those who would try to deceive you, manipulate you, coerce you, twist the word of God to their own destruction and damnation. You're going to see these things because this letter is written to the church. It's not written to the world. That's why they're called epistles. The epistles that were written from the apostles. We are given the word of God by the apostles. Jude verse 20 says, Remember the words of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why, 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 did, why, why, did, why did Jude make such a clarity there? I, I said verse 20. It was verse 17. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why does Jude make such a distinction? Because Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says in verse uh, 11 or verse 12, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12, there would be false apostles and deceitful workers. False apostles, deceitful workers. So Jude, in the harmony, in the harmony of the word of God, Jude says, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many today that claim to be apostles. I'm telling you, they're not apostles. There are still apostles, I believe, in the church, but they take that word and they use it with reckless abandonment. Everybody's a prophet today. Everybody's an apostle today. When I hear that, I get so afraid. I have, I have held two offices, three, pastor, evangelist, teacher, I have never declared myself a prophet or an apostle. I wouldn't take that on myself to self aggrandize We have people out there who've never pastored, done anything, yet they believe they are pastors. Never done a funeral, never dedicated the baby, never done anything like that. Let me get back on my subject. The apostles... That's why Jude says, you remember the words of the apostles of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, let's, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, 
the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. What's he going to do? Who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that as God, he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Here's the kicker verse. Here's the kicker verse. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. If the church is not here, why are we told to remember this scenario? Why? Because if you are here and you see this, you're going to understand clearly where we are concerning the return of Christ. We're at the very, 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 very end. Now, the question is often asked in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Who is that he? Oh, I've heard people say it's the Holy Ghost. That's not true. The Holy Ghost is going to anoint the two prophets in Revelation chapter 11. Some say the he's the church. It's not the church. The church is going to be here. Anyway, something's taken out of the way. Nothing is, is, is not uh, raptured. It says something's going to be taken out of the way. So what's in the way? What's hindering the, the revelation, the manifestation of the Antichrist? Michael the Archangel. Now watch this. Now I'm, 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 if you, my other teaching series is on the Great Tribulation versus the Wrath of God. Two hours of DVD, two hours of CDs. Get the two-hour DVD. You see me sitting there teaching this line upon line, precept upon precept. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. We exegete that verse. When it says here in Daniel 12 and 1, at that time shall Michael stand up. What does that mean? Look it up in the Hebrew. He mounts up. He ascends up. Where is Michael going? He's leaving the earth, and he starts war in heaven. How do I know? Revelation 12, verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and prevailed not. What's going to happen? When Michael ascends, Michael goes up into the heavens, will be when the Antichrist reveals himself or Michael's removal allows the revelation, the revealing of the Antichrist, and the setting up and the setting up of this stature, this idol in the Holy of Holies. And as, as, as Michael goes up into the heavenlies, he goes to the throne of God. Why? He's going to cast down Satan. Now, let's, let's look at this closely. I don't have time in, in the radio program to go through all this, but I'm going to hit it briefly, quickly. Revelation 12 and 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This is why it's called Great Tribulation. Why? I just, I just saw this probably a year or so ago, reading this again. God's going to confine Satan to the earth. Right now, Satan goes from the earth 
to heaven, heaven to the earth. He, he, he's the principality. He's the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. He's flying. He's everywhere. He's going and doing this. He's going and doing that. Job chapter 1, verse 6, 7 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence goest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So he tells God in the book of Job, the devil tells God, I've been running to and fro in the earth. I've been wreaking havoc in the earth, murdering people, getting people drunk, getting people addicted to cocaine. I've been having babies aborted. I've been destroying homes and families. I'm creating divorce, bank robbery, murder, lies. I'm doing it all. I'm doing it all, he says. So when Michael is removed, taken out of the way, taken out of the way, he's taken out of the way. It allows the Antichrist to be revealed but it also brings great tribulation. Now, let's, let's go on. Revelation 12. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The great tribulation is the wrath of Satan. The great tribulation is the wrath of Satan. Satan. It is not the wrath of God. That is why the wrath of God is in the seven, look at me now, seven vials or seven bowls, seven of them. You got seven trumpets, you got seven seals, but you got seven vials, and in those vials is filled the wrath of God. Revelation chapter 15, verse 1, Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. That's because the wrath of God, no man can abide. But we're going to have to endure Satan's wrath. People say, oh, God would never put the church through great tribulation. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Job went through great tribulation? I do. What could be more traumatic than losing every child. And let me say this. Go back and read Job chapter 1 and notice the continuation. While one servant was yet speaking, yet another came. And while he was yet speaking, yet another servant came. And while he was yet speaking, another servant came. It didn't stop. Just one right after another. That's great tribulation. Killing all of his sons taking his camels and oxen and she-asses, destroying his eldest son's home, fire coming down out of heaven. And then he smites Job with boils from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. You think that's great tribulation? You think that's great distress? I do. We're no better than Job. This is going to be a reality this is going to be a reality. I know most of you listening have never heard teaching in this depth, this clear with this with such clarity. To me, it's it's clear as as, as writing on a chalkboard that's black with white chalk. That's how clear it is to me. It's black and white. It's not amb amb ambiguous. It's not nebulous. It's not uncertainty. The Word of God lays it all out. I'm not a big promoter, a big purveyor of my books, my teachings. You know I don't get on here and hawk my stuff. We have it available. But I, I, I in this series, we got 53 verses, uh, if I remember correctly, here in Matthew 24. We're just on verse 15. People want me to teach on the end times. These other teachings, the CDs, the DVDs, 
If you put all this together, you'll have a tremendous understanding of so much about prophecy and the details of prophecy. I'm not tooting my horn. If it weren't for the grace of God, I wouldn't know these things. If I received this from God. Galatians 1, 10. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. After that 40-day fast in 1994, I walked under an anointing for two years that was absolutely mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. Every day was a revelation. Every day was understanding. Every day was a new grasp of end-time events. That's why I'm very careful what I say and what I project. Because people say, oh, the Lord could come tomorrow. I told a gentleman back then, 25 years ago in our state camp meeting, when I was still uh, an ordained minister in the church of God, I said, I'll see you this time next year. He said, no, you won't. You can't say that. I said, I'll see you for the next three and a half years, I assure you. No, you won't. You can't say that. I Guess what? It's been 25 years. I'm not in the church of God anymore, but... It ain't happened. The rapture's not took place yet. People are going to soon wake up one way or the other. They're going to wake up to the truth. I tell people, show me the church in heaven during the great tribulation. Show me the church in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Nobody can show that to me. It's all conjecture. It's all baloney. That's right, it's baloney. It's not real. You can't make it work and reconcile the entirety of the scriptures. So this abomination of desolation is going to be an idol. It's going to be a statue. This is why the Jews are going to realize, oh, my Lord, we have made a grievous, deadly mistake. Deuteronomy chapter 7 Verses 24 through 26. 24 through 26. He talks about making idols. And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou destroy them. The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt early detest it, thou shalt early abhor it, for it is a cursed thing." When this idol, this statue is set up, this is what starts great tribulation, and Israel is to immediately begin to flee. Now, as I said, I've heard all the stories, all the chicanery, all the trickery. People say, well, it's not going to be a literal statue. It's not going to be a lit literal idol setting in the temple. It's the devil setting on the seat of your heart because you're the temple of God. I've heard that story. How do we know it's a statue? How do we know it's an image, a graven image? Revelation 13, verse 14. The false prophet deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. You know, I've even heard John Hagee say the Antichrist is going to be shot. Going to be shot, going to be killed. Then they, he's going to be raised from the dead. That, that's just not true. That's, that's so dishonest. That is intellectually dishonesty. It's the worst kind of dishonesty. The Bible says the Antichrist receives a deadly wound. And what happens to that deadly wound? His deadly wound was healed h e a l e d deadly wound is healed the bible
Bible doesn't talk about a resurrection, and God gave me the revelation to that. You know why the devil cannot resurrect? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty four. That jumped out at me one day like a sounding of a trumpet. That's why, that's why his deadly wound has to be healed. Because Jesus embodies, Jesus personifies the resurrection. The resurrection. And that's why the Bible said the Antichrist, his deadly wound is what? Its deadly wound is healed. There's a vast difference in a resurrection of a dead person and a healing of a sick person. Again, not hawking, not preaching, not hammering you with my books. Revelation chapter 13 revealed, I show all of that. I exegeted every verse in Revelation chapter 13, every verse. And we show how this is factual, that the Antichrist receives a deadly wound and it is healed. And I show in the scriptures according to Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17, how it is a ischemic stroke, a stroke. Zechariah eleven seventeen says, woe to the idle shepherd. There again, you have the word idle. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be cleaned, dried up. His right eye shall be utterly darkened. What happens to people who have strokes? Their arm can wither with paralysis and they can lose their vision, their sight, because of a stroke. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. <laughs> I know this is a lot to throw out here today in one verse. That's why I said I, I couldn't teach this verse. Uh, it, it, we would stay too long on the subject. Let me speed up. I want to get done today with verse 15. There's going to be an idol, a stature, made unto this false deity, this false god called the Antichrist. It's going to be put in the temple. So therefore, Israel must be able to build a temple to have these elements and where the Antichrist can come in and create what we call the abomination of desolation. Now, let me give you another powerful nugget. Some years ago in my Bible study, as I was searching the scriptures, Seeking truth, I stumbled upon another element of truth. Have you ever asked yourself the question, and I have, and I, I can't answer part of it, I can answer the other part, was Jesus physically taken to the pinnacle of the temple? Was it a spiritual thing? Matthew chapter 4, verse 5, Then the devil taketh him, Jesus, unto the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. We'll stop right there. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. What is, what is significant about that physically? Do you know where Jesus is? Matthew 4, 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted of who? The devil. Where did the Spirit take him? Into the wilderness. But suddenly, he is now taken into the holy city, Jerusalem. Again, I, I, I don't claim to know it all, so I don't know if it was actually a, a physical transportation, a spiritual one. I, 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 I'm not qualified to say. I, I wouldn't take that on myself unless God were to reveal that truth to me. But we know he was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So he's in the wilderness, but then it says here in, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 5, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, now watch this, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. 
pinnacle of the temple. And as I was studying one day, I wanted to try to figure that out. Again, he's in the wilderness. He's transported. He's moved somehow, some way. I'm not going to say it was spiritual. I'm not going to say it was physical. But the Bible said the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Now, that's significant. The pinnacle was the wing on this august temple where the holy place was. This is why I believe that's where the statue will be placed. Now, there was a reason Satan did this, and I call it a premature abomination of desolation. Premature abomination of desolation. Satan was trying to create an abomination. How do we know that? Matthew 4, verse 6. You see, the devil's taken him out of the wilderness into the holy city. He sits Christ on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto Christ, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Satan was trying to create a premature abomination of desolation 2,000 years or thereabouts before it actually occurs. You see, the pinnacle of the temple there was over the Holy of Holies. This is, without a doubt, the very place they will undoubtedly put this idol or this statue of the Antichrist. Now, let me give you a little bit of history. Theodosian was a Hellenistic Jew. He was instrumental in translating, was actually it's transliteration, and transliteration of the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek. And that's what we call the Greek Septuagint. We're talking about the old Hebrew manuscripts being translated into Greek. And then, of course, King James, uh, you hear people say, that's Greek to me. That's Greek to me because they don't understand it. So we had the Bible transliterated, written into English. But Theodosian, Theodosian says the word nos, N-A-O-S. I've had people argue with me that 2 Thessalonians 2, when you see the Antichrist in the temple, that that's talking about your personal temple. And I understand why they might lean in that direction because 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, 17 says, Know ye not that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth within you? If any man defile the temple, him will God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. But when you look at this and exegete this correctly, he's not talking about you and I as temples. He's talking about a literal, physical temple. This is what Theodosian said, that it is going to be in the literal, physical temple in Jerusalem. Now, watch this. Uh, Matthew 23, verse 16. Woe unto them, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Bullinger, E.W. Bullinger, great, great, great theologian. He has the Companion Bible, and I am a great student 
and uh, and studying his writings, his Bible called the Companion Bible. We sell that Bible. It's a hundred dollars. I encourage you if you like me, get the large the large one for the big print, and then it's still small. I need reading glasses. Bullinger, to to make clarification, he he spelled the word temple with a capital T to distinguish between the holy place and holy of holy verses. When he capitalizes the word temple, he's talking about the whole temple, including the outer court. You see, the Gentiles will have the outer court until their time is fulfilled. Their time, and you and I are Gentiles. You're either a Gentile or you're a Jew slash Israeli. In Matthew, excuse me, in Luke chapter 21, Jesus tells us in Luke 21, 24, they shall fall by the edge of the sword. This is talking about during the great tribulation. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, how do we know that's, that that can be accurate without a doubt? Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. The Antichrist is going to seize the temple. I don't have time to get into Daniel chapter 11. If you want to go back and read Daniel chapter 11, you'll see the Antichrist is going to be in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Of all cities in the earth and the world, why there? Because Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 6 says, that's where God has put his name over Jerusalem. See? Now, notice, notice today how Trump is affecting Jerusalem by moving the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He's moved it. Other presidents had the opportunity. Other presidents would not do it. So the city, regretfully, sad to say, you can read it in Zechariah chapter 12 as well, and Daniel chapter 11, you will see that the Antichrist is going to seize Jerusalem. Jerusalem has a 5,000-year recorded history of events. That's how long the history is. Go all the way back to the, the 12th chapter of Genesis. I think it's chapter 12, when Abraham had his encounter with Melchizedek. It's chapter 14, Genesis chapter 14. And Melchizedek was king of Salem, S-A-L-E-M, Salem. He brought bread and wine. That was your first communion service. And, of course, Jerusalem is spelled J-E-R-U-S-A-L-E-M. This is Melchizedek is, is Jesus. I'm not going to get into all that today, my Lord. I would be hurling so much at you today, it'd be hard to comprehend. Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. He had no beginning and he had no end, and Abraham paid tithes to him. But he brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. The priest of the Most High God. Next week, we'll be getting into verse 16 of Matthew chapter 24. I hope some 
by some small measure of significance today. I've, I've helped to open your understanding. Luke 24, 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. I would encourage those of you today listening to me. If you really want to accelerate your understanding and Bible prophecy, get the book, Revelation chapter 13 revealed, and then get the CD or DVD series in the Great Tribulation versus the Wrath of God and Revelation study notes, the seven kings of Revelation, the abomination of desolation, and fall events. Fall events. Even Flavus Josephus believes that the Noadic flood took place in the fall of the year. Jesus was born in the fall of the year. Most Jewish theologians believe God created the earth and all of those things in the fall of the year. And we get into all of this, even about the lengthening of the shadows in Jeremiah chapter 4. When do the shadows naturally in the earth get longer? As we get in the fall of the year, is because the earth begins to tilt on its axis and cast the shadows in a longer way, the fall of the year. Again, Jeremiah 8, 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. So the summer was past. What follows summer? Fall. I, I get into such detail that I can't do that here teaching on the daily radio program. But uh, it's there. Again, Revelation chapter 13 revealed the great tribulation versus the wrath of God. Get the two DVDs there and the booklet comes with it. Great, great teaching. Not because I taught it, but it's, it's, it's uh, systematic and it's simplistic. It's, I don't make it hard. I make it as easy as possible. And then, of course, uh, uh, the uh, th three teachings on the, the, the uh, fall events, the seven kings of Revelation, and the abomination of desolation. These things will help you greatly to accelerate your understanding of Bible prophecy. And we give Bible. We always give Bible to validate these things. We just don't say it. That's what pre-tribbers do. They just say it, expect you to believe it. I give you Bible so you can see it, you can know it, you can understand it, and you can explain it to others. You can explain it to others. Before we leave the air today, again, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your fasting. Thank you for seeking God. Thank you for those of you who daily, systematically pray for us, the ministry here. Uh, you, you, you intercede on our behalf, and for that we are humbled. For that we're very grateful. For that we're very thankful. Thank you for your financial support. You'll never know how much you do in building the kingdom of God and helping us to preach the gospel, the greatest word that's ever been spoken the words of Christ our Lord. Again, let me remind you of our conference coming up this April the 5th through the 7th, Age of Deception. I want you to be there. I just feel like something supernatural, something divine is going to happen. God's going to divinely intervene, some type of spiritual intervention. We need a move of God in this nation. And we'll never see that move of God, folks. We'll never see the hand of God move in this nation until people start fasting and people start praying and seeking God. Thank you again for your love and your support. Again, the Age of Deception, April 5th, 6th, and 7th, Hickory Metro Convention Center. I, 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 would, I would be humbled and blessed if you would come support this. We've made it where everyone within seven states can come so easily and be right here with us. I think God will bless you. I know he will. I shouldn't use that term, I think. I know he will bless you and your effort. God bless you. We'll see you at this same time next week in the Lord Jesus Christ. Until then, may he forever order your steps in his most holy word. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. 
For more information, write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.